privilege of dressing you today and speak on contentment. It's a virtue that's more honored in the breach. You just talk, think about how people get together, can't think of anything else to talk about. Well, there's the weather. <laughs> and oftentimes we're complaining about the weather. <laughs> so that's it's maybe the basic conversation, but it reveals in human nature it's the, the restlessness of human hearts. It really goes further to saying that our, it's, we're unhappy with the providence of God. That easiest of all conversation topics shows that uh, the universality of human sin. But it goes beyond that. There are things that can be, weather is a funny thing to be uh, complained about because we can't really change it. But then there are things that we might feel like are under control, and then we lose control, like car trouble. And then we may think we have control over maybe how much the, the licensed have fees are. And you <laughs> vote against that or vote for a change in that, and then that gets knocked down. So there's, there are reasons to be discontent. What does the scripture say about that? Well, our text is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the doctrine which accords with godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, I suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. But we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. So first I would like you to note in our text that there is an importance to seeking contentment in the ministry. You see in our text that he, he's addressing Timothy as a man of God. So we must guard against overlooking the importance of contentment. You might think this is basic morality. Why are we talking about the contentment? That's, that's just easy. That's an ABC of, of, Christian, of the Christian walk. Well, for one thing, Paul said when he was addressing things that the Philippians had already talked about, he says in the beginning of, of the third chapter of his epistle to the Philippians, well, finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me, the right, the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So there is, there's reason to go over the basics again. But there's even more we have to avoid thinking that we have these basic, this basic morality under our belt, that we've arrived, that we've already gotten this down. Don't presume. We, there might be ways, as you examine your heart, that you still need to grow in contentment. I mean, I would I say that that has to be the case because we're all growing in progressive sanctification. So see in yourself, what way do you need to grow in contentment? There's another danger, another reason why we need to go over this again and to consider its importance. You're busy. You can't always reflect on what you're doing. So you have to be alert in ways in which Contentment could be eroding in your life in which you're not seeing, experiencing its fullness in obedience to God and in communion with him and in your love to, the, to brothers. So we have in this importance of seeking it, we have as a benefit all, we, all the reason we need to be content. And why, why is that? Well, because, for one thing, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all that dwell therein, as it says in Psalm 24. 
the fact that everything is God's, that is a benefit to us because in Christ, we are heir to all things. We are now an heir and in a part experience that blessing, but we will inherit in the consummation, in the end. So that is a reason we have to be content. But more than that, you experience even now God's daily provision. He gives you food and drink, and that's mes me uh, mentioned in the passage, that if we're, we have you know, clothing and food, with these we shall be content. There's reason right there that God is showing you that you, he provides. You have reason to be content. But also consider things you may have forgotten. What are simple things that we can overlook that we, uh, in our busyness, in our, our anxieties, we forget God has provided for us. And I was just reading uh, lectures to my students by Charles Spurgeon, and he mentioned how ministers need to experience refreshment sometimes. They, they need breaks, they, they need Sabbaths. And he said, well, if you just, if your mind is in turmoil or you're, you're discouraged in the ministry, something as simple as going for a walk and experiencing the beauty of God's creation can be a refreshment to you. So that's another thing that can be an inducement to contentment, to see, to go out and just, uh, and then around here, it's a great way, a great place to experience it, that you can see in uh, Christ, you have that a blessing of being renewed and restored. So we've gone beyond the blessing that Adam have, had of being a, a king of creation. And we in Christ, you have even more reason to experience that benefit and to know that all this beauty in the world is yours. And enjoy it and get refreshment from it. Now, Christian contentment is not the same as what we hear about in the world. You might hear about things like mindfulness or stoic resolution. They're not, these things are not contentment. And why not? Well, you can be mindful of your thoughts about things and might feel that desire is not necessary, or you might just be resolved to take things as they come, but that is not contentment. And the reason is because that is not taking God into consideration. It's not recognizing that things are occurring providentially. It is just to either see yourself as not uh, sufficiently one with the universe or not sufficiently res resigned to take fate. So those Set those unchristian versions of or counterfeits of contentment, we don't want to fall into those. We want to have a sense of the fatherly care that we are under and that we're not victims of fate. We're not victims of, of just blind trouble. We're not experiencing anxiety because we just haven't got rid of our desires. So the scriptures show us that all that give us all the reason we need to be content. And I just read a interesting uh, a illustration yesterday that a, a Christian can be content with circumstances, even with great troubles, with wars happening, with disasters, just being in lying in the wasted aftermath of, of great trouble falling upon a community uh, because we know that God is sovereign and that history is going somewhere. Instead of it being, as one author wrote, uh, just a, a, ba a trash bag filled of random events that's blown open by the wind. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that kind of perspective on the course of events. And as we consider looking at the course of events, we have the example of how to experience contentment in Scripture. Take Job. 
Job had everything suddenly ripped away. Not just all these great flocks, uh, of, uh, these herds, all destroyed. And that being just utterly calamitous in the agrarian society that he, he lived in. But more than that, all of his children were taken away. So his, his current prosperity and his legacy, and of course the love that he bore to his children, that all being uh, so cruelly pierced, it seemed, by those circumstances. And what does he say in that, in that situation? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We can also take Paul. Paul, as we're studying this uh, semester, he is going through all kinds of troubles in his life. He is experiencing a great opposition and great trouble in the ministry. But there are only, I would imagine, few that since his time have experienced the kind of opposition he, he has and then continue to live for years and carrying on with all with, with attacks within the church and without, with people uh, twisting his words, with people resisting what he has to say, with the controversies that where he feels like he's up against a group of super apostles who just seem to get the light out of opposing what he had, opposing his ministry, and they see like their their whole reason to to preach Christ is out of envy against Paul and how that must have uh, broken his heart with his deep and uh, profound uh, love of Christ and his sense of mission to, to preach his word. And in the midst of that, he says in Philippians chapter four, uh, that he, he says, I don't, I don't speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content, for I, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. There is an example of contentment. But more than that, we have the example of our Lord Jesus. When he was about to enter into his great work of, of redemption and that that climactic moment of being arrested and then unjustly tried and put to death on the cross, he prays to the Father, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And after seeing that his disciples are not keeping up with him, not really watching in prayer, but getting drowsy, but he goes apart again a second time, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And the, the great thing is that contentment, that, res, that holy resolution to enter into the will of the father, the result of it is the redemption of the world. That's uh, that his, his suffering and his his righteous blood would atone for sin. And that, what a great example we have of contentment in our Lord, that we not only can follow his example, but we know that he bought for us the inheritance of all things, and therefore we can be content. Now an application is the of and a great area of temptation, particularly for those in the ministry, is the matter of controversy within the church. And relying on God here is so important because God's inscrutable counsel allows troubles in the churches that try our souls. And it can reveal, when dealing with, it, with controversy in the church, it can reveal our remaining defilement. It can re re reveal our lack of faith. There, and there's a double danger here. We might sin in allowing our souls to be embittered when controversy arises. Uh, we might uh, 
But there's another, even another error also. We might also embrace a sinful counterfeit of contentment. We might accommodate error, relax biblical standards, and answer the siren call of unscriptural peace. Mm. Brothers, it is a great sin to have peace at the expense of purity. And we see that that is so often in the history of the church and in the churches of today, this happens. We, people will accommodate error, will soften the standards of God's word so that there can be peace and that there can be, that there can be n the numbers or there can be social stature associated with a, a so-called Christian institution. But that is not what the Bible calls us to. We must desire peace and purity. And I must tell you that if you, you the peace you desire will but at best be experienced only partially. We can only have a, a partial peace in the ministry as far as in our, our circumstances. We might have a peace in our souls, but there won't be complete peace in our work of the ministry because we are in a war for the purity of God's truth and for the holiness of, in our lives and in the lives of those to whom we minister. Friends, don't forget to be content. We need to work on it by God's grace. You have all the reason you need to be content because of God's daily provision. And he's making you heir of all things in Christ. You have the examples in scripture of how and why to be content. Most of all, you have the contentment, you see contentment in Jesus. And the result of it is his great work of redemption. You can be content even in the pain and trouble that we will experience in the ministry. Amen.